meeting new people, especially weird people, is interesting because I think every person has like a little jewel inside of them that is the mystery of them, you know, in a weird way. And so, you know, Clue might be a metaphor for this too. Every single one of these people has a mystery inside of them. And for me, finding that mystery, finding that clue, that gem is like so fun. It's just like one of my favorite things to do in the world. Faded? Exterior, interior, restaurant, bar, club, day, night, action. What's going on, everyone? This is the Restaurant Fiction Podcast, the podcast where we review every single fictional restaurant, bar, and club in TV and film. I'm your host, Monis Rose, and today our fictional restaurant is actually more of a fictional dinner party. It was held at Hill House. No, 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 not the haunting of Hill House. That's a whole nother episode. I'm talking about the Hill House featured in the 1985 movie Clue. And our guest today is none other than Kenshi Ragsdale. Now, why is he on? Well, he's on for several reasons. Number one, he was married above one of the biggest fictional restaurants of all time. But the real one, actually. Cheers. That's right. Boston, Massachusetts. Number two, he's worked in TV. He's not just worked in TV. He's worked for some of the biggest shows CSI, The West Wing, The Shield. He even was an executive at Sofia Vergara's production company. And number three, that's right, he's running for school board of Los Angeles. Yeah, we don't so uh, we don't usually uh, pick candidates. We are not a political uh, podcast, if you will, but we're supporting him, and we recommend. And we highly, highly appreciate if you do too. That's right. Los Angeles Unified School District number three. We really feel he can make a huge difference. You know, there is a lot of issues happening with the uh, school system of Los Angeles in general. And we feel Kenshi can make an amazing and outstanding positive impact. At the end of the episode, we will list how you can support, how you can donate, how you can find out more information um, on all of his altruistic endeavors that he has done in the past few years leading up to now. Yeah, that's a pretty fucking good resume. Now, without any further ado, let's get going. Here's a review of our dinner party at Hill House and our interview with Kenji Ragsdale. Go. All right, guys. So anyway, restaurant fiction, what we do is we go to fictional restaurants, we go to fictional bars, and we go to fictional clubs. Well, sometimes we get uh, pretty big or pretty big for our britches, so we get all these invitations. And one of the invitations was not really for a fictional restaurant, but it was actually for a dinner party, almost like a supper club. And we're into these hip pop-up supper clubs. I mean, that's kind of what all these uh, hipsters are doing these days. So we're like, why not? Let's go to one of these, you know? So we went to this one in a place called Hill House. It's in the New England area. All of the china are like museum pieces. The napkins are folded intricately and meticulously. We felt we were in a refinement school. I almost felt like I had to have my back straight. I had to make no sound, no elbows on the table, no, no, none of those, no slurps, no, nothing like that. That was the decorum. And sometimes in restaurant fiction, we like to be ourselves. Food's another story. You're getting top ingredients, but the menu's kind of all over the place. And what do I mean by that? Well, they first serve you shark fin soup. Now, the last time I've even seen shark fin soup was in a Chinese cookbook from the 1920s. It wasn't imitation. It was the real thing because you have the little uh, veins from the shark fin just swimming in the pool of bone broth. And then the second course was like a chicken and dumplings. It goes from shark fin soup from two chicken and dumplings, and then it's served, it's all served with red house wine. You can argue that red house wine can go with anything, 
but I just have never uh, had this. And if if somebody can tell us at Restaurant Fiction that there was some kind of flow to this, then please, please tell us. There was not really dessert. Dessert was just coffee and brandy. This first time at the uh, Hill House Supper Diner Club, you know, will it continue? I really uh, don't think so. I think it's just a one-off, one-hit wonder kind of place. Well, and you know, there was the monkey brains. Did you, do you remember that part? You know, tell us about the monkey brains. The third course, I believe, was, I don't know what they were, sautéed maybe? Uh, monkey brains? And I don't know who eats that. And by the way, very cruel. <laughs> How important is the dinner scene in Clue? It kind of takes off from the the board game, right? And when you think, no, how do you make that game? Uh, how do you make that game into the movie that it is? And it honestly is one of the best written comedies uh, forever. People who are our age loved it. And I have a theory about that. And I, I, The theory is that it came out in, what, 1988 or somewhere around there? 85. 85, sorry, 85. And then that was around the same time as VHS tapes became a thing. And parents probably rented it for their kids because they thought it was funny too, but it was just tame enough that they would like it also. It was a kind of all for all the whole family. My son loves it. He's nine. It's his favorite movie. It's my wife's favorite movie also, and one of my favorites. So I think in general, that scene is really important because it sets up all those characters and it sets up the red herring of this Washington communism thing. And it's set in 1954, which is the end of the like kind of Red Scare when McCarthy was denounced. And so it would be set in that world where everybody's scared to reveal anything about themselves because they might have been hauled in front of UAC. That's not that funny. <laughs> but it's an interesting backdrop that you don't even think about. When you watch the thing, it's these people who are wacky characters and kind of familiar from the game. But it's also this murder mystery and them trying to not reveal their secret. If I were writing a movie, this is a perfect setup. The meal is this setup where they're all talking and disagreeing, and it's hilarious. But it gives you all the little things about their characters and an inkling into their secrets. And then when Mr. Body walks in, he's like, what are they doing here? And that immediately gives you this moment of, wait, I thought he was the host. Why does he not know they're here? You have to set up these characters in some way, and you have to do it in a way that feels true to the, to the game, but also like, gives you somewhere to go you know, in terms of character building. You know, looking at the cuisine, it is there to kind of make you cringe a little, you know, shark fin soup. Mrs. Peacock says, you know, ooh, monkey brains, my, one of my favorites, whatever she says. I don't know the actual quote. The butler says, I know. <laughs> so how does he know? What about, though, this dinner scene resonates with you? That awkwardness, my family has a lot of that. We have kind of the awkwardness, but in an opposite, like a, almost a flipped way, where everybody's talking all at once, all the same time, always. Nobody's really listening to anybody. They're all just trying to get their, what they need to say in. And my family is from India, actually. And they have this like kind of point of view, and I, I've heard it's true in other Indian families. I'm not, I'm not sure because I don't know them. But there's just this feeling of like, you know what you should do? You know how you should think about this? It's, we all are experts on everything. We're all A-type in my family. When my aunt got married to this American guy, he was kind of overwhelmed, I could tell. And he was making steak one night for all of us, which is, you know, when you think of Indians, you don't think of steak, but we're assimilated in so, so many words. But uh, he was making steak, and everybody was like, you know, Brian, what you should do is this. And I walked up to him and I said, listen, Brian, you're new here, <laughs> but what you should know is that you should not listen to any of us. <laughs> That's the one thing you should listen to. Don't listen to any of them. Do what you do the best way you know how. And he, I don't know if he took that p particularly, but he's the best husband she ever had. <laughs> what can this dinner scene say about these characters? Well, it does give you the, the setup for each of them. It gives you their kind of preferences, the funny moments, the slurping. It kind of tells you a little bit about their class. You know, you have, you know, Mr. Green slurping his soup. It kind of shows that he's a little bit low class. You don't immediately know who he is or why, but what you find out later on is that he's actually an FBI agent undercover. Spoiler alert. And he's here to suss out these criminals. Miss Peacock is already known in this world, and they made this dish just for her. Professor Plum, the banter with uh, Miss Scarlet is very much shows he's kind of this misogynistic guy, and he talks a little bit of, about why he, now he's a World Health Organization UN employee and not 
a psychiatrist like he was supposed to, and they, they intimate that he slept with one of his clients. And actually, what's interesting about that, this movie was made in 1985, when I'm not sure people even, it was on their radar about that kind of thing, right? And surely not in 1954. But I think it, it is an interesting, like, kind of, inception of like, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, you shouldn't be gram- grabbing women's butts. You shouldn't be sleeping with your clients if you're in a position of power. So yeah, I thought it was a f- fascinating little twist. You're pointing out the darker tones. Those are the things that make it work. That's why it's really funny, because it is. It's a murder mystery. Murder is serious, right? But if you can figure out how to make it ridiculous at the same time, then you got something. And that juxtaposition of murder is serious to completely silly, over-the-top Madeline Kahn going, flames, flames, <laughs> on the side of my face. You know, it's, it's hilarious. I, and uh, she is amazing in this movie, too. How can a writer make a dinner party more than just like a, another vehicle for characters to talk? Unless it's the main focus of the movie, like a dinner party where that's the whole movie. There are a couple movies like that, but I think in general, if, it, if this dinner party is in the movie at all, it has to push the plot forward. In this movie, it sets up the mystery of why are they here, the question, and shows you that it's this is going to be dangerous in some way, right? And of course, it gives you character setup and it gives you the dynamics between the characters. I've developed a fair number of TV sh- series pilots, and that's one of the things, the way we talk about it sometimes. We say, if you were to take these characters out to lunch, they wouldn't agree on anything. But the one thing that you know is that they might work well together or that they can't agree on lunch, but they can do all this other stuff. You know, they're actually a family when it comes down to it or something like that. You know, that's a bad pitch. But, you know, essentially it would be like a hospital drama, and you'd say, They couldn't agree on lunch, but they love each other. They really are in the trenches together, something like that. Make a good point that even if you're creating a series or a film where there is no fictional restaurant or bar, but just in terms of the actual character work, that can be like a sidestep being like, okay, to help me create characters, what would it be like putting them in a restaurant? That could be a character development thing that you use as a kind of a little tool as a writer to think, okay, so you put them Chick-fil-A or, you know, I don't know, someplace where it would cause a little controversy. You know, you'd you'd say, well, some people would be fine with it because they just love the sandwich. And some people are there and they're like under protest because these people are not their kind of people. It reveals character. And I think that's kind of what this scene in Clue does. It, it reveals their Opinion about the situation, but the food, too, in some way. Miss Scarlet, she'll eat anything, that's what she says. And that gives you a little bit of insight into her character. She is kind of vicious, and you don't know why. You don't know who she is or why, because she's very secretive, even though she's a little, she's hinting a little bit. What kind of dinner party or even restaurant has we have not seen yet? I mean, personally... My family is a dining experience you've never seen, but it's not necessarily a restaurant. It's not a restaurant. But uh, when we all get together, we take turns making dinner, so we all don't make the same thing. You know, we all, this is my specialty, this is his specialty, this is their, you know, and we eat whatever they make. And what's cool about that is that it's such a variety of stuff. It could be the chicken curry, it could be, you know, spaghetti, it could be... You know, my sister does like Thai beef salad. That's amazing. But I'm trying to think of a restaurant thing that we haven't seen. Oh, you know what's funny? There was this restaurant in New York, and I actually never went to it, but I've heard about it. I'm hoping it's still there. They used to make grilled cheese sandwiches just in toaster ovens. That was their thing. They made everything they made in toaster ovens. So grilled cheese, macaroni and cheese, whatever it was, they made it all in toaster ovens. And I was like, that's kind of genius because, one, you don't have to invest a lot in this restaurant. But also, it's using something that, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily think. And since I heard about that, I started using my toaster oven more. I make pork chops in my toaster oven that are freaking amazing. Pretty soon, there's going to be an air fryer restaurant. Uh, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Where you do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I hate those restaurants. <laughs> I don't want to do it myself. That's why I'm going out. <laughs> You're your wife has a dinner party. Obviously, you're invited. It's your home. She invites people you do not know. Maybe two of them are a little more than odd ducks. How do you handle that situation? Usually it's me who's inviting the weird people over. My wife is much more cautious than I am, but I'm like, yeah, come on over for dinner. And I would make that fun because Meeting new people, especially weird people, is interesting because I think every person has like a little jewel inside of them that is the mystery of them, you know, in a weird way. And so, you know, Clue might be a metaphor for this too. Every single one of these people has a mystery inside of them. And for me, finding that mystery, finding that clue, that gem is 
like so fun. It's just like one of my favorite things to do in the world. And so, especially when there's somebody odd, I'm curious to talk to them. You know, I talk to people at parties that are like nobody else talks to. And my friends tell me I have some sort of superpower because I can talk to nearly anybody. I don't find it awkward, even if it might be. But I also apparently have a disarming face, so we'll see. Because <laughs> all you guys can th- see it right now. From your time at CBS to even Latin World, how many scripts even came across your desk involving a restaurant or bar? I have one that I developed with the, uh, a, another couple of young writers who are hilarious, a uh, husband and wife team, who the wife is from Chicago, and they developed like a Chicago hot dog place. And in Chicago, the hot dog places are very specific. They all have like euros also for some reason. And euros that you can only get in Chicago. Here, it's terrible. But these hot dog places have a really familiar family kind of run place, you know, kind of feeling to them. They are tend to be not like the cleanest places and you feel like maybe they didn't get an A because I don't even know in Chicago what they have. <laughs> Probably you pay them off and it's fine. Um, they had this idea to do a whole sitcom in the hot dog stand, essentially. It was like the whole show of Arrested Development was set in the banana stand. And I was like, that's hilarious. So we wanted to sell that. And it was weird because the studio told us we probably couldn't sell it. And then we took it to the network and they wanted to buy it. <laughs> but we didn't sell it because the agents pulled the project. Because they were like, the studio's not invested in this project. I don't, we don't want to sell it. And I'm like, what? That was a really painful situation. But the network said yes. I know. It's ridiculous when you have a studio that only sells to their network, right? Wouldn't you think that they would want to take a project that was pre-sold? No. Uh, you know, sometimes those weird things happen. And it might just be, like, sometimes the execs have very specific tastes, and you sometimes you can't get around that. Or sometimes they think they know the network better than the network people know themselves. So they think, well, the audience for this network isn't going to watch a you know, hot dog stand show. And I'm like, I don't see why not. They watched Big Bang Theory and they watched, you know, Two and a Half Men. Why not another family thing set in a hot dog world, you know? <laughs> it just seems to me that in that story, the uh, the studio and the network were not on the same wavelength. I had a project that um, was meant to star Rob Riggle and it was a, a writer from uh, The Daily Show who had done a lot of the Rob Riggle stuff on The Daily Show. Now this is like 10, 15 years ago. And he had pitched this project that was set in a brewery um, where the kind of illegitimate son of the brewery owner comes back after the the owner dies. Imagine if Sam Adams had the rarefied kids that were supposed to run it, but the only kid who was actually able to was this kid who nobody knew existed who could actually run the brewery, you know? And everybody else is kind of inept and, you know, too hoity-toity for it. It was a really funny idea, and Rob was supposed to play that guy. And they were looking for a project for him for years, and they didn't buy this project. Even though we sent them three concepts, including this one, and that was the one that the network said, we want that one. And the studio said, no, we want one of these other ones. (laughs) We pitched that and we didn't sell it. What are the key differences, I guess? Between TV and film? Yeah, in terms of developing. The main thing with film is attaching the right director and then attaching the right actors. And that's what brings you financing. So I was you know, running Sofia Vergara's company. And so she was attached to the Stan Lee idea. So we had the right actor, but we weren't get, attracting the right directors for some reason. I don't know if it was because we weren't taking it out right, but we kind of wanted to develop some IP around it before we made the movie. So I found the right writer. I found a financier who would put up the money for a, essentially creating a comic book and then funding a script, a spec script to then try to sell to studios. And at the time, this is kind of funny now thinking back, I had a friend who had worked for Harvey Weinstein. (laughs) And I called him and I said, hey, uh, I've never really gotten this far in a film because I'm a TV guy. And he goes, you're in a dream position. You found somebody who wants to pay for it. You You have a property that people might know, or at least a guy that created a property you might know, and a concept with a star. (laughs) We were about to sign all the contracts and everything. And the last minute, the... The company that had funded a bunch of movies that year, and w- one of the movies had won an Oscar, so they were doing very well. They, at the last minute, were like, ah, we don't actually have the money. <laughs> I was like, hmm, 
boy, that sucks. <laughs> so no, we didn't make the Stan Lee movie. And, um, but I think that the main difference is because it's driven by, you know, directors are thought of as the, crea- the auteur, even though the writer is the one that, you know, creates the roadmap and the story and all that stuff. The director is important. But in TV, it's a totally different situation. Yeah, you could have a director attached as part of the auspices. But the truth is, is uh, it is about IP sometimes. It is about who brings it into the studio, what the network needs. The TV is a writer's medium, and actually that's why I prefer it because I don't think a person who doesn't put pen to paper is the creator of anything. What do you look for when reading a script? Honestly, in television, it's really hard to find an original idea. You know, how many cop shows, how many hospital shows have you seen? But is this version of it or this angle in on this or the, the eyes in on this series, how is it something we haven't seen before? And then a voice that the writer brings to it if I'm reading a spec, that you're like, oh, this writer has something that catches me in the first five pages. And then as you read further along, if you're like, okay, these first five pages are worth continuing, you want to see how that concept was brought to bear or unfolds in a way that you didn't necessarily expect but was more satisfying than you imagined, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for the surprise, but something that where you had expectations and it took you in another direction in a subtle way that was even better than you thought it could be. What are some pitching do and don'ts? If you don't want to answer that, what is like the craziest pitch you've ever heard? Um, well, do and don'ts are don't pitch something that's not on the that what you plan to pitch. I had a pitch once with a guy who was a writer on a show I was working on, and but he had the coolest, darkest ideas you'll ever imagine. But he pitched like this. He was very quiet and kind of tentative. And, okay, so then this thing happens, and I'm like, okay, listen, um, let me stop you right there. We're going to practice this pitch a little bit, but what I want you to do, if you cannot hear your voice bouncing off the wall and behind your the people you're talking to, you're not talking loud enough. Maybe that quiet comes from insecurity. As a, as a writer, you're pitching, you're performing in a way that is a skill set that is never meant for you. You were meant to, as a writer, probably sit in a room alone and write and come up with beautiful things, you know? But you are not meant to perform it for these people. But unfortunately, that's how the, the process works here. You should be able to like hire a, like a surrogate pitcher for your ideas. I think that would be amazing. But we don't do that here because they want to know that you're, you feel really passionately about this idea or else they don't really, they're not, they don't dig it, right? After several kind of quiet practices with this guy, he was still not getting it. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Do you have kids? And he said, yeah, I have two kids. And they're, then they're, I said, how old are they? And, you know, three and five. Or I'm just like, okay. So imagine yourself, you're on the sidewalk and your kid starts to run towards the street and there's a truck coming. You have to stop that kid right now. Stop him or he's going to die. And he, he's like, oh. And I'm like, that's how you have to pitch. It's urgent. You are the expert, and you need to make them understand now, or else they're not going to buy this. And he suddenly could pitch. It was like a light switch turned on in this guy, and I was like, "Oh, he just needed the right like motivation or something." I don't even I don't even take credit for that. It was just like, "What am I going to say to this guy to get him out of his shell?" And then he pitched. He did great. It was an interesting moment because I realized sometimes getting the performance out of somebody who you need to perform who's not meant to do it. I've been in ri- pitches with writers where they were reading off a page and they were shaking, scared, shaking, scared, because it's a lot of pressure. You know, Part of the thing when you pitch is you are the expert. So anything they ask you, you have answers for. And if you don't, you're creative. Make something up. I think that's partly the skill set that you need to have as a writer. That actually works for writers. You can make stuff up. You can think, okay, I know this character and this is what they do in this situation. right? If you know your characters well enough, they could ask you about anything and you know how to how they would react in that situation right because these are real people now right uh when you're pitching by the time you're pitching them they need to be real people and if they're not you you didn't break them correctly at least in my experience it used to be that you just pitch them a concept and they would buy the show but nowadays you're pitching yeah you know like full characters and everything what are bad recommendations you hear in your profession or expert or area of expertise you know, I think a lot of people get the give the advice that worked for them. But as people who know the industry, they should think about what would work for somebody now and extrapolate from their experience. For instance, I started as a, you know, an assistant and or like I was technically the script coordinator in a feature development department at a big production company. And I realized I didn't want to be on that kind of creative side and I started watching like The West Wing. This was 1999. And I was like, "Wow, 
TV is not anything I imagined it could be. Look at this show. I want to work on that show. And strangely enough, about eight months later, I was actually working on that show. I got a job as like a writer's PA on that show. And I think, one, use your network in the right way. Don't call your people just when you need a job. Find ways to become friends with them so that if you were going to ask them for a job, they would want to help you because you're a friend of theirs, right? That's just like basic dating advice. You know? um, get to know somebody before you ask them to go home with you. The other thing is, is, so in development where I've been, people often say, well, you started an agency and then you work your way up and then to an assistant and then, and then you, you jump to a desk at a production company or a studio and then you can work your way up to executive at one of those kind of places. And either you're running the company, the production company, or you're, you know, you become an exec at the, the network or the studio. And I think that's terrible advice because it doesn't actually prepare you for the job of being an executive. Yes, you have the connections, so that's great. That's the first part that's good. And as an agency assistant, a lot of these kids like come in and they are really good at the networking part. But they're not good at the like actual story skills necessarily. A lot of companies say when they're looking for assistance, I want agency experience. Because what that means to them is that that person can handle a huge volume of work and still be okay. Because studios always think they have a huge volume of work. And TV, yeah, they do, but not as much as an agency would. But what they really need is somebody who can be another brain, right? If I'm an executive and I'm not using my assistant to bounce ideas off of too, I'm not doing the best I can be. Your assistant is usually the age of the audience you want, right? And so if creatively they can't identify or analyze what they're reading to think, oh, maybe I would watch this or maybe people I know would watch this, then you don't necessarily want them. It's like when you watch those TV shows that are like, that they see three houses and they buy the one that was the nicest because they couldn't figure out what color to paint their living room and the other one that was actually the one they should buy. In your trajectory, you want somebody who can see what a place looks like despite the paint color. You want them to be able to imagine, not necessarily a specific solution, but identifying where it could be better or you know just more effective. You are invited to the Hill House dinner party. You do have to bring something, or at least you are a polite human being, you know, a kind and generous human being who does bring something. What are you bringing to a dinner party? Well, besides a bulletproof vest, you know, ambiance of the movie and and that dinner party, I think you might bring cigars and like cognac or something like that. I wouldn't personally bring that because I don't smoke or drink. Something like oddly hoity-toity and fancy and like almost gives you uh, you know status in a way that is kind of unwarranted or unearned. <laughs> Beyond that, yeah, I'm trying to think of what you could bring that would be like interesting. Yeah, yeah, I gotta go. I keep on coming back to the the bulletproof vest. <laughs> bulletproof vest, it is, Kenji. This was incredible. This was awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was. Enjoy. Thank. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, this was really fun. Kenji, that was fucking awesome. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you. And I really appreciate what you are doing to all of the young minds growing up in this beautiful city of angels. Now, guys, usually recommend you just go on IMDb and check out our guests' amazing line of work. And yes, you can do that, of course, with Kenshi. You know, his shows are The West Wing and CSI, uh, that sort of thing. But really, if you really want to make an impact, get to know our outstanding guests on a much more personal level, just like we have, go to his personal website, KenshiRagsdale.com. That's K-E-N-C-H-Y-R-A-G-S-D-A-L-E.com. We will even put it in the little bio, the little synopsis of this episode. You can learn about him. You can learn about what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do for the Los Angeles Unified School District as well. You can meet his beautiful son, his beautiful wife. You can donate. You can even contact him, go on his socials. I mean, it's all there. That is the best way to learn about this amazing guest. Uh, He does not put any information on his love of Clue. That's why you have to listen to this episode I apologize. Uh, Yeah, we need some traffic here as well. Self-plug, self-plug, self-plug. And of course, uh, we do not ask for donations. Give your money to Kenshi. But what we do ask is if you give us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you hear this Restaurant Fiction podcast. My name is Monis Rose. And as always, keep it real, keep it fresh and keep it on the flip side.